Yes, folks, it's Tales uh, from the Jails with John G. Sutton. Do please like and subscribe. It's down there, folks. Yeah, that's very kind of you. Anyway, uh, I'm going to talk today about the block at Strangeways in the uh, 70s and 80s when I worked there because the block was certainly the deterrent. People say that uh, the prisons today are run by gangs, and that the staff are no longer in control. Well, certainly in the 70s and 80s, uh, there were certain prisons that were known as what's known as screws jails, or screws necks, yeah? Because uh, they were definitely run by the staff. And uh, all institutions really do, as a general rule, run for the benefit of the staff. I don't know if you realise that, you know, well, certainly, because uh, that, that's how it works. Well, certainly it was the case at Strangeways, uh, and that the block was uh, located on D1 landing. Now, D1 landing was an end case, it had a roof on it, yeah, that was, uh, above that was D2 landing, yeah. And that, but that was encased. It was the, the it was a floor there, and that was the ceiling of D one. And D one was had two sides to it. One was the punishment block, A the block, and the other was the segregation unit, where people who were deemed to be potentially at, at risk or a threat to the security of the prison or in need of uh, a strong location they were held in, in in such places as the segregation unit there they were holding people like terry sinclair who was the the handless corpse killer which you may have read about in times past uh, in uh, the chorley area there's a a, a flooded quarry called Ecclestone Delf, and uh, two divers there found a mutilated body towards the bottom of the of the Delf of, of, of the flooded quarry, and uh, the hands had been removed, chopped off, so that you couldn't get the fingerprints, and the face had been smashed in turned out that the body was that of a man called Marty Johnson and uh, the leader of the, the drug dealing, international drug dealing gang that uh, was responsible for this was uh, a man called Terry Sinclair, real name Terry Clark, otherwise known as Mr Big or the Australian Jackal. Uh, he was an extremely wealthy individual who had a yacht, numerous mansions around the place, around the world. Uh, he was from New Zealand originally. He had a big mansion in New Zealand. Uh, and he was an extremely erudite, intelligent and interesting individual that I met on the block. But he was in the segregation unit, not, not the punishment unit. Mm. He was an art collector as well. He had books on art in his cell. We were discussing uh, the Impressionists when I when I went to take him his medication. He was uh, very keen on Claude Monet, yeah, the one of the early Impressionists. And uh, he said he had a work, an original work by Monet in his uh, mansion in uh, New Zealand. More on Terry Sinclair in in due course of time. Certainly in my next book, he, he is featured, uh, yeah. That will be part three, which I'm working on now at the moment, folks. I don't know if you've read part one and part two. But part three uh, deals with uh, my dealings with Terry Sinclair and some surprising details there, which I will disclose exclusively in my memoir anyway uh, so the block at strange ways how it ran yeah any transgressions on the landing snatched uplifted by a heavy team drag kicking screaming down into the segregation unit or the block uh, clothes ripped off thrown into a cell 
and then you got an introduction, personal one-to-one -one introduction to the school bully, otherwise known as Bootsy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Call him Bootsy. People say, why do they call him Bootsy? It's nothing to do with kicking people at all. I never saw personally Bootsy do anything like that. But they call him Bootsy because he wore ammunition boots. That's army style great big boots. He had big feet and they had uh, metal studs at the bottom. They weren't just leather soles, they had metal studs at the bottom and on the heels. So that when Bootsy came stamping down D1 landing, it was boom, boom, like that. You know, you could hear him coming. Yeah, hence the name Bootsy, yeah. School bully, because uh, one of the tricks was that uh, you get a couple of lads outside with him as well, then he opened the cellar to a new entrance to the, the block and uh, says to them something along the lines of, you've got 10 seconds to actually hit me, and if you haven't done so within that 10 seconds, I'm going to give you the best beating of your life. So if you reckon you've got a shot in you, take it now. I never saw anybody win. If they came anywhere close, there was a team behind him, by the way. Uh, so that that was uh, the deterrent at Strange Ways. And it really, I, I agree, it was uh, not hardly humane. It, it was uh, definitely uh, human rights infringements and all that going on, but at the same time, Strange Ways was operating as a screw's neck, yeah? It was under control, and Norman Brown presided over it. You see, what happened after Norman Brown left and retired, they had a, a new governor, I mean, I'm saying nothing wrong with him, he was a, obviously a kind, educated, religious man, I believe. And uh, it, there just wasn't that determined grip them kind of attitude that there was under Norman Brown. Because Norman Brown, if, if one of Norman Brown's officers said that he'd seen an inmate floating around the middle of the landings on golden wings, then that's what, that's what had happened. Because one of Norman Brown's officers had stated that. He, he, he was definitely uh, supporting his staff. Whereas today, I mean, look, they're all getting locked up, aren't they? It's ridiculous. So anyway, that's how the block worked at Strange Ways. And at Wormwood Scrubs, it was very similar. At Wormwood Scrubs, they didn't hesitate. Any, any inmates that kicked off got snatched. I don't believe that happens today. I mean, how are you going to do it? I mean, you've got the Vernon's girls, haven't you? Or is it the Beverly sisters? Hmm. The hostess system. What are they going to do? Handbags at dawn? Yeah. No, seriously. Back in the 70s, early 70s and 80s, that's how it worked. Step out of line. Meet the school bully. Right. I'm going to read you a poem now. That is a song dinger, by the way, but it's not a song. Although I was going to sing you a song today. I was going to sing, Who's sorry now? Whose heart is breaking? For breaking that vow. Yeah, I, but I don't think you want to hear that nonsense, do you? My impersonation of Connie Francis isn't uh, up to much, I can tell you that. So I'm going to read you a little few lines from Shakespeare. Um, what should I read you here? Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's all right. The Quality of Mercy. How about that? From the Merchant of Venice. Yeah. Are you sitting comfortably? Good, then I shall begin. The Quality of Mercy is not strained. It droppeth like the gentle rain from heaven upon the place beneath. It is twice blessed. It blesseth him that gives and 
him that takes. Tis mightiest in the mightiest. It becomes the throned monarch better than his crown. His scepter shows the force of temporal power, the attributes to awe and majesty, wherein doth sit the dread and fear of kings. But mercy is above this sceptered sway. It is enthroned in the hearts of kings. It is an attribute to God himself. And earthly power doth then show like as gods when mercy seasons justice. The quality of mercy from the Merchant of Venice. Porsche's speech, yeah. Anyway, uh, I sincerely hope you've enjoyed Tales from the Jails today. This is John G. Sutton. <laughs>